Yeah, so basically at this point, they're trying to uh, smear Miss Barry any way that they can at this point. And, you know, it's just come down to how nasty this election, I think, is going to get. And I think that it really, it's just more motivation for us to go out and show up to the polls and to make sure that our voice is heard that just in case the Democrats do find a way to try to block it, which I I don't know any, any way off the top of my head they could block something like this. Um, but just in case, if we show up to the polls, we get President Trump reelected, then, you know, we're good to go. We have another four years of President Trump. And then we also, you know, are going to have another Supreme Court Justice nominee. It's going to be basically five and a half to three and a half conservative liberal, realistically. Um, right. I know. we got to call Roberts a half. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> realistically. And then, you know, we'll be good to go. And hopefully the uh, the liberals won't won't go too crazy and, and, and try to spark that, that war that they seem like they, they want. So. Yeah, and what I think is going to happen is the conservatives are always more pragmatic, practical than the liberals, in my opinion. So I think, like Justice Thomas, if Trump gets reelected, I think he'd wait till like the third year or last year of Trump's yeah. term. And if we still have the Senate, he'd step down because I think he's pushing 80 right now. And he's smart enough to know that if he could, you know, get himself replaced by that. That was RBG's mistake that she really didn't want to step down. And if she would have done that, her, her seat would have been safe, but she didn't want to do it then. And then they lost the Senate and now they're in this position. So I think they're kicking themselves. And it is kind of scary to think that they say they'd go with that nuclear option and basically push all sorts of legislation through. And they want to pack the court and, you know, say expand the, the Supreme Court to 15 justices. And obviously they'd oh, nominate man. another six yeah. and it'd be, six to, to nine instead of the six, three now. So, I mean, stuff like that's just crazy. And I think if, if they push that message out, if the conservatives push that message out, it's going to scare people to think that they do something extreme like that, that has never been done in hundreds of years. No, nobody wants that, especially the people that are just in the middle. They don't want to see something like that. Yeah. No, I think you made a great point. I mean, Ginsburg, she should have stepped down in 2014, 2015. Um, that's, that's what she should have did. And I mean, at this point, you know, we 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 can't suffer because of her mistake, right? Now it it, it it's too late. Now coming around 2020, when you should have done something, you know, six years ago, to try to guilt us into trying to push back what we want because you made a mistake. Now I got an interesting question for you. What do you think about implementing term limits for these Supreme Court justices? I mean, I'm all for term limits for senators and congressmen, but I think that part of it is that when you have the lifetime appointment, it's that you know that they they don't have to do anything to, to gain favor. But at the same time with the term limits, I guess they wouldn't either. But I just, I think the lifetime is, is better. You know, overall, I just prefer that because it's it's why they do it and it would you'd get a different makeup of the court like right now Trump chose somebody who's 48 years old mm -hmm. he now that Barbara Legault I think was 38 and a lot of people were saying that he was going to go with her because look at RBG she was 87 you put a 38 year old that's almost 50 years she could serve even now with Amy Coney Barrett she's looking at 40 years if she makes it to 87 88 years yeah. old so if let's say they wanted to do 10 or 15 year terms, you could nominate somebody that was 60 and still be relatively confident that they're going to be there at 70 or 75. So you might get a better quality because even now with Amy Coney Barrett, she's only been on the, the circuit court, I think, for like a year or two. She was just, wow. uh, you know, went through her confirmation for that. And now she's going right to the Supreme Court. So she's the type of person that in 10 or 12 years at 60 she could be nominated if there were term limits. And obviously you would assume she'd have more experience and, and be a better judge. But I I don't think it's something that's necessary. I'm I'm a traditionalist as far as the government goes. You know, I, it, I think it's the same way that, you know, like Scalia is an originalist, somebody who looks at the laws and looks at the Constitution and it is what it is. Don't try to read into it. And I think, look, this government isn't perfect, like they say, but it's the best there's ever been. You know, there's never been a country with a better government 
that's produced more for their people than this one. So I think it's a, a mistake to try to change really anything as far as how it is right now. You know, we had we had to overcome some issues, obviously, civil rights, different things that that needed to be fixed. But right now, I think we're in a really good place and I, I don't see change in anything to be a benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Miss Barry is an originalist. Um, she sees things or she tries to see things in a way that the founders uh, see them. Um, she doesn't believe in the Constitution as a as a as a living document. And I think that's what most conservatives agree with. Um, they want things to be carried out in a way that our founding fathers uh, would have wanted them to be carried out. Um, she's also, uh, she was a, a Scalia uh, clerk back in the day. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, I think she is the, the perfect nominee. I, I really don't, again, there's, to me, it's obvious why the liberals are trying to play dirty to try to poke holes in the nomination because she is qualified and she is the perfect pick for us. Um, and they're really just playing the same game that they tried to play um, with um, um, uh, what's who um, uh, name is escaping me. The last one. Uh, Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. Yep, trying to play the same right. game that they played with Kavanaugh, where they tried to pull all the skeletons out of his closet and you know try to accuse him of you know sexual misconduct and and pulling out things from you know, what he did at his frat and trying to degrade everything about the man. And, you know, it's just really laughable that they went to such an extreme thing with Kavanaugh because you look at the guy, just a family guy. Nobody had ever had a bad word to say about him. And then all of a sudden, 30 years ago, they're accusing him of being a rapist. And look, there's there's guys that, you know, the, the frat bros, as they yeah. call them, or people where they say, hey, they're there's date rape or there's things that take place in, in colleges where nobody doubts that that happens. But to try to say Brett Kavanaugh was one of those guys looking at his past and his, his whole track record, that d did not fit with his character at all. You know, it's just it was hard to believe in the fact that they took it that far with somebody who's even their own friend said, I don't remember any of this. Nobody really would even vouch for uh, what's it, Blasey Ford, you yeah. know, so in, in even something so empty. And so such weak evidence, they pushed it forward and actually thought people were dumb enough to believe that. That was just, that was a travesty. What they did to that guy, I mean, was terrible. He's in tears. His whole family is just, it's, it's terrifying, really, that they could act like that. Yeah. And these are the good, these are the professionals on their side. You know, these are the senators mm -hmm. and the people who are supposed to be educated. And you see what, what Antifa and their uneducated <laughs> um, street people do, but they're not much better. I mean, these guys are kneeling and sitting and... Remember they did that sit-in? They were sitting down on the floor in the Senate, and, you know, they act like children, and they're supposed to be the adults. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. And I, honestly, you know, this whole year, 2020, man, like, I'm not surprised by anything that, that happens. I knew at the beginning of the year it seemed like when, uh, you know, when Kobe Bryant passed away, and then you had Corona come up, and then you had, you know, George Floyd, and now you got Breonna Taylor. You know, Gansbury passing away, it's, and then you got the election. It's just 2020 just keeps rolling, man. Yeah, this this year is is like a book or a movie. Like you can't even, you know, as they say, truth is stranger than fiction. Really, this year is just unbelievable with what's going on, and that's why I can't imagine this election just going smoothly. Like that 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 would be a surprise if either way, if either person won, and it seemed pretty clear, and there was no issue with mail in ballots, and there was no issue with um you know fraudulent votes or anything and it wasn't contested and it didn't end up in court i'd be shocked i think everybody's expecting that at this point yeah. i think like two-thirds of the country when they polled them think that this is ending up in court and and i'm one of those people yeah no i i saw a video um that was done by a bloomberg guy axios and they were talking about the red mirage and how with these mail-in ballots being so prevalent this time around for this election, what could happen is, is that on election night, we could see President Trump uh, winning on paper and being announced a winner. But then, let's say a week later, it could come back when all these mail-in votes have been counted. They might say that Biden is the winner. And to me, right. in that scenario, that is civil war, in my opinion. I, I, I don't... Right. I, I, I just... 
I don't see how the right will be able to accept something like that um, happening. But I have a gut feeling that with these mail-in ballots, with this corona stuff, it's a lot more likely than, you know, people are letting off. And that is what I'm really worried about. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. And I think we're going to see two different elections depending on which network you're watching. If you watch Fox, I think a lot of states are going to get called early on for Trump based on the votes that they're getting. And you're going to see CNN holding off and MSNBC holding off on making those calls and saying, hey, we've been informed by a source on the ground or somebody at a precinct that there's still more votes out there. Or there's there's a warehouse in, uh, you know, Cleveland somewhere or Milwaukee. And you're going to start hearing that they, you know, there was something that happened with that in Florida, I believe, in Dade County um, with the midterms, too, where they said, oh, no, there was actually something. We found some votes. So. I think you're going to see two different elections and that Fox will end up calling it for oh. Trump and saying he's won all these states. And CNN and MSNBC are going to say there's tons of votes out there and that we have to wait. And look, Hillary said flat out that Biden should not concede under any circumstances. And we know that he's a puppet. So <laughs> she's, she, he'll do whatever they tell him. So if they tell him don't concede, he's not conceding. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, and, and, you know, CNN, um, ironically, the same night, that they have played up, you know, this Breonna Taylor decision and tried to fan the flames on that. We're also talking about how President Trump is, you know, not necessarily committed to a peaceful transfer in power. And it's like, well, what does that mean? I mean, are you trying to say that President Trump is going to declare war if he loses? Like, are you talking about his his constituents? Are you talking about his his voter base? Like, who, who are you talking about? Right. Like, because. The president can't guarantee that his voters may not be upset or they may not, you know, uh, protest right. or, or, or do whatever. Like, he can't guarantee that. No, and I think he kind of, he does this to troll the media. It's like, I remember when it was back with the uh, the disinfectant thing when they said he said inject Lysol or bleach. And then right after, once he saw he got all the backlash, he just said, oh, I was being sarcastic at the time. When... Anybody who watched it knew he was being pretty serious. Yeah. He, he was, you know, but he knew that they would know he was lying when he said he's being sarcastic. <laughs> so he intentionally just says, oh, I was, I was sarcastic, by the way. And they're screaming on all these networks saying he just lied again. And he's a master at trolling them. So he's been doing the same thing with the election saying, oh, when they say four more years, tell them it's eight more because my first term really didn't count because of what they did to me. <laughs> so. He's acting like he's redshirting for a fifth year in college basketball because of an injury or something. Like he can, he gets a do over. And then he said, it's four more years and then we negotiate. He just said the other day. So I'm thinking when he says that stuff, he knows it's just getting them riled up. But I don't really foresee a scenario where he gets reelected now and then come January 2025, he says, ah, I'm not really leaving. I think that's super far fetched. You know, he'll be almost 80 years old at that point. And there'd be no reason for him to do something like that. I mean, they, they want him to be this dictator, but that's not real yeah, life. No, Trump's not a dictator. Um, I, I don't think that we would ever get to a point where um, he would not step down. Honestly, I think he would rather step down and go back to running uh, the Trump organization and, and just kind of doing his thing as a marketer. Um, even though, you know, he loves his country, obviously he, he wants to do the best for his country, but you know, if the will of the American people says, hey, you know what, we don't want you here, you know, to be president anymore. I think he's going to step down. I, I don't think he's going to, yeah. you know, he might he might go out swinging, but I, I think he's going to step down, you know. Right. And his I do think that if it goes to the court, he's going to win, especially now if he gets another justice. Yeah. Just that six three. Yeah. I won't count on. I'm, I actually I'm willing to bet almost anything that Roberts would rule against him. So that's why this is so crucial, because you would end up seeing that 4-4 split. You know, we, we know we can't count on Roberts. So if he gets this justice in, I almost don't see a way he loses if it goes to court. You know, they're, they, they're going to fight it with everything they got. But what you're going to see, I mean, we all know what's going to happen, is they're going to say this isn't legitimate again. And that he's not my president now and that he stole, they already said he stole the first yeah. term. So if he, and you think about it, that he's laying the groundwork for this now by fast tracking this justice through. And then that justice is what he uses 
to win him the election, it's just going to look crazy. And by the way, this is a total aside, but on his tax issue, even the New York Times just reported they saw nothing as far as financial connections to Russia in the last 20 years. So that narrative has been dispelled over and over. And now, you know, I don't I, I think there's more likely that Biden's working with China at this point for this election. <laughs> You know, I mean, I, yeah, that was such a joke. Yeah, the, the, the Russia thing is 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 interesting to me because you know they keep they keep pulling that out, and it's like, bro, y'all literally have zero evidence. If anything, his foreign policy has suggested that he's not in bed with Russia. He's you know been adversarial with Putin. You know, he'll come in the media and, and troll every now and then, and you know give a compliment. But it's like, let it go. Like just just let right. it go. You know. Right. Yeah, at at this point, people still haven't gotten over it, though. I mean, people are just can't get over that election. And you've never seen where people, it's like you go on Twitter and somebody has a bio of just a couple lines. They can tell you something about themselves and they'll say resistor or resist or not my president. And it's so crazy to me because I couldn't stand Obama, yeah. you know, uh, but there was never a point where that was part of who I became was somebody who was anti-Obama. You know what I mean? Like that's a, like, a, like a never Barack or a never, you know, or not my president. It was never that. It's like, look, the guy's the president and until he loses, you know, or till he, he serves his two terms. But I never got that consumed with him. So Trump's just so polarizing that he was like the, the perfect weapon to make these people crack, you know, yeah, it, it, it's crazy, man. I mean, I, I see a meme every day, you know, or, or a video every day on Twitter of, you know, some, you know, short haired, you know, white, you know, liberal crying and, and, and whining about, you know, something that Trump did. And it, hating Trump is a personality. It really is at this point. Right. It's a personality. It's a cult. It's a religion. And, you know, I, None of these people can ever explain what exactly has Trump done to make you hate him. They always want right. to point to things that he says, and they really can't even point that out because they don't listen to him. Liberals don't listen to conservatives, one. So you don't know what he's saying because you don't listen. And at this point, it just seems to me that you've decided in your mind that you don't like President Trump. You're never going to give him an opportunity. You don't care, and that you're only concerned with causing more chaos and confusion to try to get your way, and that's the only thing right. you're concerned about. So, right, and, go ahead. Well, yeah, and I think that's the sad part is that they only believe what they're told. I have a good friend of mine who can't stand President Trump, and when Trump says something that he gets, you know, triggered by or whatever it is. He comes to me and he says, translate this this for me, because I know you have a different take than what I think. You're going to tell me he didn't really say this and what he really meant yeah. was. And and that's something that liberals go crazy about. They always write in comments or post online that why does what Trump said always need an explanation and you need to tell us what he really said. And I, I think it's because they love twisting his words. I, I was talking to you earlier, uh, you know, off camera. And we were saying about when Trump said at his rally, he said, look at my African-American over there. Isn't he the greatest? Yeah. And I took that. I saw Trump smiling from ear to ear. He was one at the time, one of the only African-American supporters in the crowd. And he had a sign and it made him happy. So he said, look at my African-American. Maybe he should have said my African-American supporter. But it was just in the moment he was happy. And he said, isn't he the greatest? And the left turned that into see how racist Trump is like he thought he owned, he said my, because he thought he owned him or something. I mean, I'm thinking they're twisting that so far that they're, if you're, if your mind can go to that place, then you'll never give this guy a shot. You know, if you, if you can latch on to anything he says and turn it into something terrible, then he has no chance with them. Oh yeah. You know? Absolutely. No, I 100% agree. I think in that situation, he probably just got kind of, uh, he probably lost his thoughts, honestly, in terms of mm -hmm. thinking about, okay, what is the politically correct thing for me to say. And I think right. that's why he said my African American. And what I think he really wanted to say is look at my black friend. That's my right. black friend. Right? And I right. think that's what he really wanted to say and African American seems to be a term that they use to try to be politically correct. Right. But a lot of people don't even want to be referred to as African Americans. No. We're not African. 
I'm, I'm not from Africa. Right. I've never been to Africa. I don't know right. anything about Africa. I don't have a connection with Africa. So I don't understand right. why you're trying to refer to me as an African, uh, African-American. And the Democrats have basically um, used this term and have tried to, you know, turn it to something where it's like, oh, you need to be politically correct. And I think he was just trying to play into that. And I think that's what happened with right. the comment. Right. And what's funny about that is, like you said about the term, is that they always it's this these liberals with this, you know, white guilt or whatever you want to call it to where they go to a place where they need to feel like they're going above and beyond and they can't treat black people as equal. They always feel like they need to do more so they can. It's more about themselves than black people. You know, it's more about these the white people who think they need to go further. And instead, why are we just called white? We don't say, you know, you're European Americans and, you know, it's, it's good enough for us to just say white but they feel bad about calling black people black, you know, because they don't feel like it's proper. And, you know, that changes over the years every time. There, there's words I used five or 10 years ago that aren't allowed anymore, you know, that all of a sudden people say, hey, that's offensive, you know, so you really never know what you can and can't say. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and the new term they love to use now is uh, POC, personal color. <laughs> but they want to lump. <laughs> And apparently, you know, the LBGTQ uh, Q community is now, you know, POC as well, where they try to lump oh, everybody that's not white into this 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 one right. term. And your plight is all the same. And it's just right. further dividing America along the lines of white and non-white. And that right. plays, in my opinion, to the Democrat agenda in the playbook of just causing more chaos and confusion and then turning around and placing that blame on Trump when it's really their own social constructions that they've come up with that have caused this instead of President Trump. Right. And it goes to, it really reveals who they truly are in the sense that they think the the whole identity politics thing, they think is, is everything. It, that it never matters your character. It never matters what you've done in your life or how you think or how you feel. It only matters what your gender is, what your so, race yeah. is, what your religion is. And again, we had that conversation off camera, but that's the left has become this collection of all these people who just, the only thing they have in common is they hate people on the right because they think the people on the right hate them. So whether it's women or whether it's Muslims or whether it's uh, LGBTQ or whether it's black people or Latinos, they're all told that you have to be on our side because the other side doesn't like you for who you are. When really, we just don't view any of that as something that should be the way to judge somebody. We think that they should just be judged on if they're good people or not, and not what they look like. And for them, it's that's their key issue, you know. And that's and it unfortunately it works, you know, that they keep so many people out of the Republican Party by telling them we hate them, and that you can't go there if you're Muslim because they're Islamophobic, and you can't go there if they're black, you're black because they're racist. And if people could get past that, the Democrats, I don't think, would even exist as a party. They might be a third party, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. But that keeps them going. Yeah, absolutely. No, I 100% agree because, again, like we was talking about off cameras, most of these people, a good example, uh, Muslims, are conservative. I mean, they're the most conservative group of people on the planet. So it doesn't make sense for why you would align right. with the Democrats <laughs> and this super liberal agenda because it's literally against your culture. <laughs> like. Right. Can you think, think about it? They're, they, yeah, they're fighting for gay marriage, for you know women to get equal wages, right? And I'm not saying these things are bad. I'm saying, but if you're Muslim, in their countries, you know, it's a mortal sin to to be gay. They're throwing gay people off buildings. They're not allowing women to leave the house without a veil on, and and then they're on the side that wants liberation for everybody. And it, it doesn't make sense why they would ever support that but because they're told that we hate muslims and or trump's muslim ban they're they're not going to come around oh yeah oh yeah they, they they hate that and you know with black people you know um most of us are conservative right you have especially in the south right i mean we we i'm not saying we're not accepting of the lbgt community i mean we are but it's like it's one of those things just we know right where it's just like a, a, right. a mindset was like very strong Christian values. And we know right. that that doesn't necessarily align with those those beliefs, right? And, and it's, it's one of those things where I think that it's interesting how 
the left has allowed this to be pushed on us and how powerful the language and the rhetoric of racism is that it can override a religion. Right. <laughs> That's how powerful right. that rhetoric of racist is. It's crazy. Right. And I, it's you're right. And it, what's crazy to me, too, is that, you know, I'm Catholic and it used to be that, you know, if you're a religious person, basically, as a Christian, you vote right because you feel like the left wants to get rid of, rid of your religious liberties and they're always infringing. On you. Crazy to me that I think it's like more than 50 percent of Catholics are voting. But I just can't look, I, I don't have an issue with gay marriages from a, a moral standpoint, you know, religiously, obviously, I'm, I'm Catholic, but I don't have an issue with that. But you can't say that you're a, a practicing Catholic and you support that is and you support um, abortion. You know, those aren't compatible. And the same with Muslims and the same with Jews, to be honest. So 90 percent of the people who are religious in America, there is a problem in their religion with that. So it's it's just funny to me that they still go one way. You know, even the left. Look at look at how hardcore um, the left is embracing like Palestine and they're becoming more and more anti-Israel. Yet 75 percent of Jewish people vote left. Even Bernie Sanders he is Jewish, and he's aligns himself with Ilhan Omar and people that say some pretty, pretty terrible stuff about Israel and Jewish people. So it just doesn't make sense. It's like we're living in a simulation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they're 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 more they're more secular. They're more, um, you know, not as accepting of you know certain people's religious beliefs. And to a certain extent, like from a libertarian standpoint, like it's like you said, I don't have a problem with, you know, gay marriage or anything like that. I'm just I just don't think I think my problem is a lot of it is being pushed on people. Right. I think that's the issue. When you right. start to push it on people as if you are trying to be like, hey, you should think about this, especially. At a right. Age, right. That's yeah. When I think that a lot of people kind of stop and be like, hmm, I don't know about this. Right, because what right. you do in your spare time, in your personal life, ain't got nothing to do with that, right? Um, and I think the government should not have anything to do with it. But you know, at the same time, I think the left is pushing certain things on us. For example, I don't know if you know that movie Cuties on Netflix. Oh, I heard about it. The Netflix. Yes. Yeah, it, it's basically like child, you know. I ain't right. Gonna say the it's word terrible because, you know, I don't know if you're right. going to censor me for it. But right. Yeah, it, it, it's it, it's it's stuff like that that the left is doing that a lot of people just can't get with and get behind because they're taking it too far and it's, and it's too extreme. So I think that we should uh we should probably get into Breonna Taylor. All right. Go ahead. Yeah, man. So Breonna Taylor, quite honestly, man, I, I'm sick and tired of talking about this, really. Because to me, I, I feel like I try not to, to get too caught up in the details in terms of what actually happened because nobody knows what really happened down to the exact detail. The way I try to right. look at it is that police had a warrant. The address on their warrant was correct. It was a no-knock warrant, but they chose to knock. I ain't going to get caught in the details of whether or not, you know, I ain't getting caught in details of that. That's that's what the, that's what they said. They go inside. They were shot at first. They shot back. Breonna Taylor got caught in the crossfire, unfortunately. That's the way I look at it. And when I look at it like that, you know, it sucks. It's terrible. It's tragic. But I think that justice has been served in the sense that, legally speaking, I don't see how the cops have did anything wrong. And, it's, I mean, you can say they came in and they – they were, um, you know, reckless in terms of the way they were, they were firing. But one one cop got a um, uh, a, a charge for uh, wanton endangerment for that for shooting right. into the other apartment. But people are mad because they didn't get any charges related to the actual death of Breonna Taylor. Well, again, tell me legally speaking, like, what did they actually what actually went wrong for them to actually get a charge? What did they do that was illegal for them to actually? get a charge because my interpretation of it is that it is unclear who was acting as the aggressor and who was acting in self-defense, especially considering that 
the law enforcement officers were acting in their official capacity. That is my conclusion based off of what I've read up on this situation. And I, and I think you're right. I mean, again, I don't know all the facts and I think they're disputed, but the point is this case was presented to a grand jury. And I believe in Kentucky, the grand jury is composed of 12 people all right, from the general public. And nine of those people need to say that they think there was reasonable cause that a crime has been committed, that there's enough evidence that a crime has been committed. And that has nothing to do with the attorney general, Daniel Cameron, in this case. And we had spoken about this earlier, that Daniel Cameron did his job because it wasn't up to him. Had he gotten uh, indictments on these officers for killing Breonna Taylor, then he would prosecute them. But it wasn't his call to make. And it's sickening to me that this guy's getting attacked saying he's pushing a white supremacist agenda and that people are saying, oh, had she been white, that then the grand jury would have indicted these officers and then there there would be charges. That's just crazy because, again, these guys, the warrant was legal. It was, a, it was originally a no knock. They changed it to a knock and announce. You had a neighbor say he heard them announce. But I will say on the other side of it, the warrant was based on, from my understanding, the warrant was based on her ex-boyfriend being a drug dealer and her residence was considered a place where there were con they thought that they were running drugs out of. So apparently she had split with him and she was with a new guy and she, they said she was trying to move on with her life. And I'll, I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and say that's the case. But unfortunately, for a lot of people, that's not how it works. That what if you're involved with selling drugs or you're with somebody in that world, you can't the next day say, hey, I'm, I'm done with that and I'm going to move on with my life. And it, it doesn't come back to haunt you, unfortunately. That's just not realistic. So they showed up at the house and he said, we were laying in bed. I didn't hear that they said it was police, but they forced entry. Somebody came into the house and he shot. And I don't, I don't blame him. If he really didn't know that it was the police and he said he was thinking it was this ex-boyfriend, this, this drug dealer coming in to come after him or her. So that's completely understandable. I'm all for the second amendment and they didn't end up finding any drugs. But unfortunately, once you fire a shot at the police and they were legally entitled to be there, they're going to fire back. And the one who was charged, I believe it's because they said he shot through, a instead of they were in the hallway, but he shot through a window and a patio door so he fired in two different locations, just kind of blindly, like firing in there. But obviously, if his shots were the one that killed her, he would have been charged with, with a wrongful death there. And they would have been able to go after him for that. And he would have been charged with some sort of homicide, whether it was manslaughter or second degree murder, whatever. But it, he didn't do that. It was because he hit walls and there was a family living in another apartment. You know, so he wasn't the one that actually killed her, apparently. So, I mean, it's sad on both sides. Probably had they known that she wasn't with this guy anymore and she wasn't involved in that life, maybe this warrant wouldn't have been issued and it wouldn't have been executed in that way and she'd still be alive. But to say that Daniel Cameron is intentionally doing something wrong because he's black and he really supports white people, which we heard something similar saying this is part of a white supremacist agenda, to me that's crazy. That's like saying you know, with no evidence that we faked the moon landing or something. What are you basing Daniel Cameron is racist against black people or supports white supremacy on? That's that's just out of touch. Yeah, so I think what they're trying to say is, essentially, is that there's this systemically racist system in which Daniel Cameron is a part of this systemically racist system and that he was forced to basically carry out this systemically racist agenda against uh, the family of Breonna Taylor and by not charging these officers in which these people have a fundamental misunderstanding because it is not up to him, right, right. to move forward with that. So I think that's what it comes from. And I think these people feel like he has more power than he actually does when it comes to moving forward with what they would call justice. And to me... I just feel like when black people start to call other, you know, black people, you know, white supremacists and sellouts and coons and things of that nature, 
it just shows that they have a fundamental misunderstanding of what this man's job actually is and that Breonna Taylor and the quote unquote black agenda is not above the law. It's just not right. Right. And it's just one of those things. I just got a lot of feelings on it. Um, and I really don't want to get too much, <laughs> get too deep in into that because, you know, I could go on all day really about how I feel about people calling another black man, you know, a white supremacist or accusing him of carrying out a white agenda because it's it's really just ridiculous on his face, really, to be quite honest. Right. And, it, and it, this, unfortunately, is par for the course. If you remember back with... Philando Castile, and I think that was in Minnesota as well. Um, you know, he was shot in his car, and that we had some live footage of after the shooting took place, where basically they said he was reaching for his license or registration, and that he was shot. But regardless of what the actual facts or details were, of that there was nothing that showed that this had anything to do with race. No evidence, and I believe the cop who shot him was Latino and Asian. Yep. He was he was biracial. I don't I'm not exactly sure what, but he this happened and, and it's a tragedy. But immediately the governor of Minnesota came out and said that, unfortunately, if Philando Castile had been white, he'd probably still be alive. And to, for a governor to come out and kind of be the person that's going to incite violence now. You know, because when you tell if, if it's the governor, he's considered a reliable, legitimate source for the state. And he comes out and says, hey, you know what? They killed this guy because he was black with no evidence. <laughs> that's that's just terrible. It's like uh, it, it makes no sense. And then that was all they needed to feel justified to peacefully protest or riot or whatever they're going to do, because the governor just told you this guy only was killed for being black. And. Just looking at the facts as I heard them, I um, if I was a cop and and I somebody told me I have a gun, and then he told me do not move, and the guy made a quick reach after telling me he had a gun. You know, in that moment, who knows what you're going to do? And maybe that needs better training. I don't know, but to me, that had nothing to do with race, and there's still no evidence that it had anything to do with race. Yeah, I know the race conversation is a distraction, and the Democrats love to play out the race conversation just for that reason. Um, because it, it takes away from what we really should be talking about, which is, you know, how do we lead up into that situation, right? Like, what personal decisions, what personal choices did that person make? Were they not following the orders from the police officer? Um, how did they end up on a search warrant? What were they doing to put that stuff in a situation where they had to interact with a police officer in the first place? And also, if it so happens that the police officer did do something illegal or wrong, the race conversation also takes away from which laws need to be changed on the books that can help prevent this from happening in the future. Rand Paul at least tried with Brianna's law to, you know, um, try to get rid of no-knock warrants. Now, some people disagree whether or not it makes it, you know, these warrants safer or not uh, being knock versus no-knock, but at least he was trying to do something. And then after right. the RNC, Rand Paul, you know, is outside and people are talking about, Say her name, say her name, trying to attack him. And I'm like, guys, <laughs> right. this man Literally. is trying to work with you, right? Like, you may yeah. not agree with exactly he, what he's trying to do, but he's somebody that obviously cares. It's his state. Yeah, he's literally the guy that's done the most. Not only did he say her name, he put her name into a law that he was passing to prevent this from happening. He took, he did the most he possibly could to fix this situation and he gets attacked. But that just shows you how uninformed these people are that they could attack the one guy who was doing exactly what they were yelling at him to do. You say her name, he said it, and he took action. And actually, Louisville has already um, banned the no-knock warrants now. But it's tough because I think that is a good tool because, like they said, I think Brandon Tatum has said and other guys have said, who knows from the time they, they you know, announced that they were there, were they flushing and crushing drugs and getting rid of stuff? And there was stuff there, but he got rid of it. You know, who really knows? And I think that's the point of these no-knock warrants, that if, it, if it's a drug case and you knock and you're waiting and you keep saying police and knocking, it doesn't take long for somebody to pour something into a toilet and get rid of it. So if you're really trying to catch somebody with something that they could get rid of easily, you could see the benefit to it. But I think the risk is people can die. So in my in my mind, if it's just over drugs, 
you shouldn't do it. You know, I, I, I don't like that because you are putting uh, people in a situation where mistakes can happen and somebody's going to die. And I don't care if they had, you know, five kilos of coke in there or some weed or whatever. There shouldn't be gunshots getting fired and, and people dying over drugs. You know, we have enough of that in the streets, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, and again, you know, dying in the streets behind uh, drugs and, you know, gang violence and stuff like that. That's why I always try to come back to, you know, personal responsibility. Like, why did Breonna Taylor end up on that warrant in the first place so that the police had authority to kick her door in in the, in the first place? And, right. You know, somebody just made a comment, and I want to, and I think this is a great comment, something to talk about. I'm not sure if you can speak on this too much, but they say black people are really worshiping her. It's sad. And that's true. I think a lot of, you know, leftist Twitter um, and black Twitter specifically, they're doing this new thing where they, they want to worship black women, right? Like this whole, you know, protect black women thing and, you know, Black Lives Matter basically being a, a, a feminist group. Uh, all the founders basically being, you know, um, LBGTQ black women, basically. It is to the point now where we are worshiping these people. We're worshiping people who really shouldn't be worshipped, right? Right. Um, you know, and I'm not saying, again, I'm not trying to, you know, denigrate Breonna Taylor any way. I'm just, I just have questions in terms of, you know, what was she doing in order to end up on that search warrant where they had a no knock. Right. When, like, you know, and my understanding of it is that you just can't get one of those. You have to have a judge sign off on it. And, you know, it has to go through multiple levels of scrutiny before you can get it. Right. Because they, right. they don't just. Exactly. Them. Yeah. Like so. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what they had. They had an informant, somebody that they thought was credible enough that could give them this firsthand information about what they knew was going on. And they got the warrant. But I think therein lies the problem with what you said is that you make everybody a martyr like her her case is different than George Floyd, obviously. Absolutely. George Floyd, he was in an actual police interaction. And I still don't know what he actually did or didn't do other than he was in a police interaction and it went terribly wrong. You know, there, you could you can place blame on both sides there, him in the sense if he was resisting, but that cop just shouldn't have been doing that. Like when I saw it, I still can't justify that and say, oh, well, the cop did what he needed to do there. Like that to me it's as close to murder as you can get in the sense it's at least manslaughter like the guy but they are they did come out and say that he had enough fentanyl in his yep. system and drugs whatever so maybe the cop didn't kill him but just the visuals the visuals of it itself and that's another case that now you have to see if the evidence actually does show that george floyd died from drugs and that he was going to die from the amount of drugs in his body no matter what anybody did what is this jury going to think? Imagine being on that jury knowing that people are going to know who you are. You're going to come out of that courtroom. And if you acquit this guy on those charges and everybody in the city, it's going to burn again, right? There's no question. If that guy gets off in a trial, that's it. You know what I mean? Oh, there's yeah. just, there's no way, Even whether it's right or wrong, there's no way. It's going to it's gonna be Breonna Taylor probably times five or 10. Oh man. I mean, that's, Really, that's what started everything, and that that is one of the worst videos I've seen. The Eric Garner stuff was tough, you know. So there was there were some bad situations. That Tamir Rice was sad, you know. There's a lot of bad situations, but seeing somebody like that, and I think the amount of time that it went on, you can see how it upset people, you know. So now, if they don't think there's justice, I mean, look what happened because they didn't charge them within 24 hours, or what did they end up charging the officers and. 48 hours, 72 hours, but that was enough for the whole country to go up in flames. So if they get off now, it's going to be ridiculous. Yeah, and I think Barkley made a great point. Um, I'm not sure if you saw his comments, but he said essentially the same thing that you said. We're now at the point where we are lumping in all these cases into one thing when, again, this is why I say racism is a distraction because these are two totally different situations i mean we've lumped this in with ahmaud aubrey and ahmaud mm -hmm. aubrey has nothing to do with police right? right and right you can't solve any of these problems at an individual level because you've lumped them all together as just this problem of just racism and that's why we can't really you know get to a solution and that's why there's so much chaos and confusion because right we're making these situations that are completely different that have nothing to do with each other 
all the same thing. And and I think you just said it there. That is like a microcosm of the entire problem. The entire problem is you're taking years of systemic racism, whether it's slavery or Jim Crow, right? All that to now where the only systemic stuff that we have anything to do with race is actually to give a little different treatment to to black people or Latinos as far as affirmative action or diversity quotas or anything like that. So the only thing that's actually codified that's actually into law in our system is to give some sort of advantage to minority groups, you know, but there's nothing there. So their whole beef, I guess the people who say there's systemic racism is just that the system is set up, the outcomes are unequal. And to me, and, and, and what the court has usually held is that it should only be equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. You know, if, if you and me both, both go try out for a team or anything else, one of us might make it, one might not. But as long as we both got a fair shake, but what they want is the results to always be the same. That's so socialism. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Communism. Right. That's and that's, want. that's, that exactly. You're getting back to their fundamental principles for them is that everybody's entitled to the same outcome. So you need to make, you hear Bernie say it about millionaires and billionaires all the time. Like he's disgusted and it's like, well, some people do work harder than others. Some people are luckier than others, but that's the whole point. But to say it, to, nobody's going to, there's no incentive if everybody ends up in the same place, you know? And like you said earlier, when we were off camera, that where's personal responsibility come into that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, the appeal of somebody like Bernie is that he takes away personal responsibility, right? He takes away, okay, I don't, you know, I don't have to work as hard as the next person and I can end up in the same place, right? He tries right. to, he tries to, he tries to reverse it. And I think that what happens is, is that people don't understand that innovation comes out of the reward of the idea of reward that you're, that you may be able to make a lot of money off of it. Right. That you can change lives, that you can affect, you know, change. Right. Right. We're not sitting here talking on this live stream without somebody thinking that, hey, I want to change somebody's life or, hey, I want to make, you know, millions of dollars. You know, I want to be rich. You know, that's how capitalism works. And because of that, it's made everybody's lives better. And it is it is also increased the standard of living that we have in this country. And it's the reason why. Basically, you can't go any other go to any other country on Earth and have a better standard of living than the United States because of the rate in which you know our technological growth happens due to the rewards and the inequalities that are inherent in the system. Some level of inequality is good. Now, I do think you know capitalism does have you know excesses. However, I feel that the good outweighs the bad. Um, very strongly based off some of the things we've seen in the past, you know, with, you know, the Soviet Union, right? They was mm -hmm. out here trying to make their own cars, right? And we see how that, 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 played right. Out, right? They tried to basically plan the whole economy and they couldn't mm -hmm. even, they couldn't feed people, right? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't let the market do it. <laughs> right. No, you're a hundred percent right. And that's, that's the problem is that all these people, they're such hypocrites. It's just like Bernie Sanders. There's there's actually a uh, they've done a study and it shows that conservatives are actually a little more charitable than Democrats. Oh, absolutely. And they like they say they're very they're very uh, altruistic, you know, as long as they're they're using other people's money. It's not never really themselves. You know, they love giving away other people's money. And that's the thing that look at look at this country that you could put up a GoFundMe and say you have a sick baby or that you were hurt in an accident or anything. And if that story just gets onto the news or goes viral on social media, whatever it is, you put a goal of $10,000 in a couple of days, you'll have hundreds of thousands because that's the type of people we are as Americans. We want to help anybody. I don't care if the person's black or Asian or anything, a man or a woman, a child, that's what happens. But unfortunately, if you take so much from, from us as people that you know, you're taking 50 cents on the dollar at a certain point, then it's going to be hard for people to give it away. And honestly, we can spend our money better than the government. You know, they're, they waste our money. I saw something they were studying like bear DNA in Montana, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in this program and things that, you know, if you've got enough to, to, to use, it's one thing, but we're running deficits and wasting money on crazy stuff. 
Oh, yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. I, I 100% agree with that. Um, I just think it it all stems from college, right? And, and, and being in these, these liberal institutions where you're required and forced to take these sociology and these gender courses that have ingrained this idea that, you know, inequality and disparities are inherently bad, even though we see inequality and disparities everywhere. Right. It's like we talked about with, you know, basketball, the NBA. Right. Like, you know, black men make up what, 80, 85 percent of the league. Should we change that so that now it is only 13 percent of the league (laughs) is 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 black men. Right. To fit the population. Right. Like, could you imagine work? Why some disparities good and then other ones are bad? Because, again, I feel like a lot of white people want to go in the NBA and probably make millions of dollars to play basketball. Or Asians, or you know, right. or Hispanics, right? It, we see this across the board. And not, and you know what's funny? It really depends on which group it is, because it's okay if things, like you said, if it's the NBA and it's completely going one way. Let's say in this case for Black people, they're okay with that. But with Harvard or these Ivy League schools keeping out Asians because they say there's too many, you know, they're basically. <laughs> it's like it, like what you said. If they did that with the NBA, people would be outraged and say, "Oh, why? Why would you do that? It's racist. Like you can't base that on race. It just has to be whoever's the best for the position gets the the job on the team, right?" But with Harvard, they say, "Oh, well, we have too many Asian people, so we need to take somebody else." And they're discriminating against Asians in that way because it's okay. That's still acceptable for people, you know. And it's just ridiculous that they play favorites with groups and whoever's they decide has more political capital for them is who's going to benefit, you know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you've seen, but like UCLA is like literally 60, 65, 70 percent Asian. Yeah. So, I mean, you have. And, Go ahead. Well, and, and I think is that now I don't know, but I believe that California, the state schools that they got rid of affirmative action. I'm pretty sure, I can't remember, but it's state school. You know, the government can't do it. Private schools can. Can, But I'm pretty sure that that happened. And that's why, you know, because like you said, uh, UCLA is a California state school because those those laws only apply to the government. It's just like people with freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. You know, they think that 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 look what's happening to us on Facebook or YouTube or Google. We're getting censored and people always chime in wow, that's against my First Amendment right, and they don't realize those, those laws, the First Amendment only applies to government inhibiting your speech. So that's why you can go on a public sidewalk and they can't shut you down for protesting. But if you go into Walmart and you start holding a sign and marching around, they can kick you out. That has nothing to do with your First Amendment. But people are just misinformed, you know, so they think these laws apply to everybody and they don't. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I 100% agree with that. I think it's, I, I just think it's interesting in terms of where we're going in, in society. I think we're, over time, we're being pushed more far left um, as, as, as things seem to go on. So I think that's why it's even more important that, you know, we get Miss Barry uh, confirmed as soon as possible. You got any uh, predictions in terms of when the Senate is going to confirm on that? I, I think the timeline they're on is going to be almost perfect. I, I know they're going to start hearing soon, and they're they're shooting for an October 26th, which is basically, what, a week before the election that they would like to have a vote by October 26th. And I'll tell you what, I'd be surprised if they're not within a couple of days of that. You know, I, I would, be, to be honest, they'll do it up until that day. You know, whether it's election day, the t- that Tuesday, or it's that Monday, you know, whatever day it is, I think I think it's going to happen, though. I don't see how because, to be honest, it the country needs it to avoid a crisis like we said, where Roberts sides with the the liberal justices, mm-hmm. and we have a split, and the Supreme Court can't figure out this election. We can't. That that would be a real crisis for the whole country. Yeah. No, I I, I 100% uh, agree with that. So it looks like we're about two hours here and, you know, probably an hour and something of it was us trying was to, real. Yeah. To yeah. Get, I was going to say get it fixed. So I think we're going to go ahead and try to um, close out. And um, I just want to talk about the debate real quick. You got yeah. any predictions for the debate? Well, I'm still going to be shocked if it takes place. It's so funny to me to think that 
you know, everybody knows Joe Biden's biggest weakness is speaking off the cuff. You know, even he's having problems with the teleprompter. We all seen the videos, him saying, move it up, or he's doing interviews, you know, and he's reading off a teleprompter with his answers, or he's at a, a rally or not a rally, but a press conference. And he's specifically looking for reporters by name. So he's been so scripted that I think you're going to see the same thing at the debate if it does take place, that he's going to be looking down at notes and have these canned answers that he's trying to read and it's not going to come off well. And I think Trump's just going to demolish him. I think it's going to really, the contrast between how sharp Trump is and how witty and, and how he can improvise in the moment and with Biden, who's so scripted and he loses his train of thought, I think that once those people who are still sitting on the fence, they say it's five to 10 percent of voters, that they really see that. I don't see how you could vote for Biden. I think it's he's going to really have a bad go of it there. Yeah, I think that uh, two person debates are definitely going to be in the advantage of President Trump. And the reason why is because, like you said, you know, President Trump is better at speaking off the cuff. Um, he's a straight shooter. And I think what's going to happen is, is that Trump is going to try to lure him into uh, getting off of his talking points. And if Trump can get Biden off of his talking points, he can really, really, really hammer him, especially on certain subjects like the crime bill. Right. If he can hammer him on the crime bill, if he can hammer him on uh, on Kamala's record, um, if he can hammer him on things, things like that, I think that he's going to really be able to separate himself mentally from President Biden and show the American people, like, listen, look at this man's record. He can't even have a real conversation with me because he's so mentally drained and he's just so out of it that he's not even fit to be in office. And <laughs> I think that a lot of people that if there are people still on the fence, honestly, I don't know if people are still on the fence. I think a lot of people have already kind of, um, you know, drawn their sides. And I think historically speaking, I don't think that debates really change things too much. But I think that that could be different this time around. Because right. It's just I think there's just a start, such a stark difference between Biden's mental capabilities versus President Trump's at this point. And if the longest President Trump can get him off his talking points, hammer him on things, because, again, I, the black vote is, is, is what is I think is what it's going to come down to. I really do. Um, if he can really hammer him on things that involve trying to make the black voters question Biden. I think he can really do some damage to him as long as he can get him off his talking points and hammer him on very specific things. Yeah, I think you're right, man. I think that Biden's true colors, we had talked about this earlier too uh, off camera, that he, we, we both believe that if either of these two guys were racist, it'd be Joe Biden. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. if you anytime that comes out, whether, you know, he's saying about uh, my state was a slave state to yeah. to relate to southern voters or stuff like that. And, you know, what he had said back in the 90s when he was talking about the crime bill, about saying, uh, you know, that he doesn't want his kids in the racial jungle and all this stuff. Well, that was about segregation back in the 70s with the busing. But he's all his true colors always come out. And you've never heard anything as blatant from President Trump, as you have from Joe Biden. So I think you're right that he's so entitled to that black vote that he thinks he can say anything like those moments where he said that you ain't black if you're not voting for me, whatever. And if something like that comes out in front of the whole country, it's going to look really bad. And I, I don't think Biden's going to be able to handle the pressure. I mean, he he flips out on everybody all the time. He told the one voter, vote for somebody else if you don't like me. Or he told the one guy he's fat and told him to do push-ups or <laughs> the dog face pony soldier, whatever he said. So, And it's not a good look on Biden. Like Trump, you've come to accept that. And it's actually expected for Trump to talk a certain way. Remember Rubio tried to do it with him during the Republican debates yep. and trying to, it, he looked like a little boy. It looked really bad. It only works for Donald Trump. So if he can get Joe to say, I'll take you behind the gym and all the stuff, you know, he likes to talk. It's not going to look good. Yeah, I think he needs to. I think one point, if he wants to see film, right? When, you, when you're when you playing sports, when you're an athlete, you watch film, right? To, you know, see what the opponent's doing, to figure out their weaknesses. The only film that he needs to watch is Kamala Harris when he <laughs> hammered Joe Biden on being right. a 
segregationist or strongly implying that he's a segregationist. Right. Right. Uh, his opposition to busing. Right. He hammer him on that again. Kamala. That's Kamala's playbook. Right. And the Me Too thing. Right. The, the, the sexual assault uh, and the one rape allegation. Right. That's amazing that that stuff's went away. You know, I mean, it's not because it's on the left. But I'm just saying, like, what? It's it's crazy. There's so much to attack Biden on that that stuff's gotten buried. He's, you know, in a lot of ways, he's like their Trump, how he was back in 2016. They thought he was the gift that keeps on giving as far as he said that Judge Curiel, because he was Mexican, he couldn't be fair, you know, to Trump. He said all these things. Remember the Gold Star parents? Yeah. They said he attacked. And every time Trump did something, they said, this is it. It's over for him. Then the Access Hollywood tape came out and they thought that was really it. And it never was. And I think that's what happened with Biden, that there's been so many of these like dementia moments for him or things where, you know, if you remember from the Democratic debates, they all thought he was done. All the people on the left, if you watch CNN or anywhere, they said, well, it's obvious that he's not going to win. He was at like 5% in the odds of getting the nomination. And then, you know, this whatever it was, the smoke filled room or something, they all got together and they dropped out. And this is. What's funny is they did it to themselves again. They forced Hillary through in 2016 and, and, and cheated Bernie out of it. And this time they pushed it to get Joe Biden. So they're going to get their wish at these debates. Because let, let's be honest, Bernie Sanders, like him or not, as crazy as he is, his brain's a lot more functioning than Joe Biden's. And he would be able to perform a heck of a lot better at a debate than Joe Biden. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, they. I mean, they screwed Bernie over this time too. I mean, when they, right. you know, before Super Tuesday, right. You know, when they made uh, Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar drop out, why they kept Pocahontas in the race? Right. They, <laughs> essentially, they matched up Bernie and and Pocahontas because they have the far left and they left right. the, the moderates um, for Joe Biden. Yep. And essentially, yep. that's them screwing over uh, Bernie. And what was surprising to me is that Pocahontas was in bed with it. Right. She was on board that's- with it. That's the great point, and that's what the funny thing is, that that was a plan that you needed everybody. Like, if if just Pete Buttigieg said, you know what, I'm not dropping out, Joe Biden doesn't get the nomination. You know what I mean? If any if any of those guys, the moderates, you know, whoever they wanted to call them, the, the, I think they're all pretty far left, but he wouldn't have got the nomination. Or like you said, if Warren would have just said, you know what, I can't win this thing, I'm getting out, Bernie wins. So the fact that they all got behind Biden as just, you know, they were the kingmakers here. It's ridiculous. And I think they're going to pay for it big time on election day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I Honestly, I thought that should have been the end of the Democrat Party. When they did it twice, you know, when they screwed Bernie over twice, I mean, I, I think the far left at that point should have just, you know, been like, you know, we're done. We'd rather vote for Trump than to, you know, be a part of a party where democracy essentially does not matter. Like, your vote does not matter. Your vote doesn't matter right now. Because we all know that Kamala is really the one that's going to be running this country. Yeah, and they keep saying it, the Harris-Biden administration, you know, over and over. And you know what I think is, if to be honest, and this isn't just some, uh, you know, ploy here, but if I was a Democrat or I was somebody who's really on the left, a liberal, I would not want Joe Biden to win because you're encouraging the establishment here. And if they would send a message and not turn out for him, I think it would be the last thing the party needed to say, you know what, this was a mistake, you know, because they didn't get the message the first time with Hillary and now they put her through. Honestly, I think Bernie would have won in 2016, you know, because he the, the states they needed, he performed well in. You know, he wasn't he wasn't going to win Florida, you know, he wasn't going to win some of the other the the other swing states, yeah. but he would have held on to those white voters up in Wisconsin and Michigan. You know, he I think he beat Hillary in Michigan, so they didn't have him. And I think Biden would have been able to pull it out. You're only talking 70,000 votes back in 2016. He was more with it, but they made the mistake of pushing Hillary. And now Biden, his ship has sailed. This guy should not be anywhere near a presidential campaign. You know, he has no shot in my mind of being able to run a country. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, that's why they've been hiding him in. And, and, and promoting <laughs> Kamala, really. And it, it, it's just become fairly obvious that you don't know what you're getting when you vote for the Harris-Biden uh, administration um, or a.k.a. Biden-Harris administration. So we'll see, man. Um, yeah. But it looks like we're 
two hours and ten minutes. Um, yeah, we're so I think we've we thoroughly hashed out more things than we, we had on the agenda. Sure, man, and we've put in some great technical work too. So next time, hopefully the the technical issues will be ready to go and taken care of, and and we can uh, do this again. Yeah, man, I'm gonna have to probably wire up my internet directly to the computer. I think that that's probably the fix. Um, uh, and, and I was thinking of that too. If you had a, a Ethernet or something, the hard line, and but we'll see. We can experiment some more. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I thank you for the conversation, man. I was nervous uh, at the start of it, but you know, when, especially when we start having those technical difficulties, I'm like, oh man, I felt like we started off so strong. You know, yeah, I, I feel like I, I know. talk about a game, and then once I got you know got into it with these technical uh, difficulties trying to monitor, I know. I'm just like, oh, like I, you know, like what's going on? So, you know, I'm glad we got through it. Um, I hope the audience, you know, wasn't too turned off and I hope that, you know, it, it gives you a little boost. Um, as yeah. well. and, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on and having the conversation. I hope that we can do this again. Same here, man, Greg, I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, for all you guys who, if I don't know if you suffered through this or the, the issues were too much, but give us another shot. <laughs> and I appreciate you guys staying with us. I see some people still in the chat have been here the whole shout time. Out, yeah, so shout out to them. you guys are awesome. Yeah, all you guys, I appreciate it. And we look forward to doing this again soon. All right, man, it's been real. All right, Greg, take it easy, my friend. All right, peace. See ya. All right, I ended it.